Whereas on a video, you capture somebody. You capture somebody's eyes, you capture someone's mannerisms, you capture the way they speak, you capture the gaps in how they speak. And you capture whether somebody can captivate you and whether, you know, whether they are a fit for you. Ian, welcome. Well, thank you for having us. Thank you for coming. What about me? I'm a bloke from the northeast, from County Durham. I left when I was 18, after I did my A levels. I was like Billy Elliot, who couldn't dance. So I came away to York to be a school teacher, worked as doorman. I've been a professional musician since I was 19, outside of my career. I was a teacher for 20 years. I taught kids with learning disabilities and with behavioral problems. I did some pioneering work with the home office where I set up a thing called Crime Reduction in Secondary Schools 2000, which was to raise attainment, raise aspirations of young people, keep them in school and keep them out of correction centres. Uh, that was the year that one school went from, I think, 21 uh, permanent exclusions in a year to zero. And that fell in line with the same year that my hair went from brown to grey and to white. <laughs> so there you go. Um, then in 2009, um, my mother died suddenly. Sorry to hear that. And uh, it just gave me a bit of a different perspective on life. And I thought, mm -hmm. do you know what? I'm doing a job that I don't necessarily fit in with because education wasn't ideal mm. i thought education was still hammering the same round pegs into square holes it did with me dad in 1952 same exams mm. same thing you've got to do nine subjects you've got to do sciences you've got to do you know modern foreign languages you've got to do this the world doesn't need another rubbish physicist <laughs> you know like if someone's really good with their hands why on earth are yeah. we making them do physics and chemistry when we should be actually using our time to hone the fact that they can mend and make any anything right and if you've got somebody who's creative why are we all reading about Shakespeare from 500 years ago when we say right there you go there's a blank piece of paper write write more write more hone that craft hone that craft because that's what we need we need new ideas we need the next generation the world is spinning so I was speaking at a conference about this and how education doesn't really fit people and kids shouldn't fit on league tables because they weren't meant to fit on league tables and suddenly we should realize that schools were built around the students within them not around the teachers not around the governors not around the government but around the kids and that was quite a you know quite an it was a bit of a wild card opinion but I'll, I'll stand by it now so I got headhunted Somebody said, all the stuff you've done with kids with learning disabilities, where you focus on the individual and you don't just give them something off off the peg and you actually create something for them, why don't we do that with dementia care? Now, I, I didn't really come across dementia care particularly. And then I got talking to somebody and they said, this isn't an interview. I want you you tell me how much and that's what happened so I gave him a price um, I was being touted to be a head teacher I was at sort of like an assistant ed level senior teacher level and I didn't want it because every promotion I was getting in teaching was getting me further away from the reason I went into the job and the reason I went into the job with the kids and instead I was seeing fewer kids and more spreadsheets, <laughs> fewer kids, and more grown-ups. Mm. What, age, what age range were you? I was um, well. I started off um, when I worked in special ed from like seven all the way to eighteen. Because special ed, you would have them all in one building, sort of thing, and you'd mm. have the progression. Mm. But then it got to eleven to eighteen. Mm. I'd mainly eleven to sixteen, and uh, I just found every promotion, every pay grade, was another room away from the people that I loved the job for and that's that was really sad so when this offer came along I just lost my mum and I thought do you know what is this a present that I've been left when's the last time somebody came up to you and, and just said I want you 
They don't. You have to look for an advert, then you've got to go there. You've got to lie about your CV. You've got to make yourself sound better than you are. You've got to... Come Just tell on. yourself. Oh, <laughs> I hate interviews. I'm rubbish at interviews. And that's why I've been headhunted, because my interviews have been a lot longer and they've been based on what I actually do and not what I say. Because yeah. I think sometimes I intimidate people in an interview, in a job interview type thing. I had one guy, uh, he had an in-school unit in a school in York, and I'd set up umpteen of these, so this was like a doddle job, but the pay was nice. So I turned up and he actually said to me, now back, back then I was, what, 390, 400 pounds. I was 28 stone eight. I was the size of a house in a big black suit. I'm 12 and a half stone lighter now. And he just said, you can do this job. I'm not going to give you this thing. You're the second best candidate. He says, but I'm not going to give you the job. And he actually said, I'm not going to give you the job because I don't think I could manage you <laughs> if I disagreed with you. Now, a bit of me thought, you spineless little bloke. But then again, I thought he was being pretty honest there. Mm -hmm. And so I never got that job. And then, so as I say, I got headhunted into care. I transformed one company's um, care resources for training. I won Care Trainer of the Year as an independent, which is very rare. You normally win it when you work for one of the sponsors of the event. He said <laughs> controversially, but I tell you what, check all the figures. Sponsors win awards at awards nights. So I was completely independent there, uh, did that, and then people wanted to work with me. And so I then started working independently and lots of companies brought me in, people, even like people like the CQC, the Nursing and Midwifery Council brought me to do big events. And it's just me, Big Ian. Now, I've got a website called bigian.co.uk. Now, it should be called something like Training for Carers or Conference Speaker so-and-so, but it's not. It's called Big Ian because that's all I am. I'm a bloke on a phone with a few good ideas who works for nobody but with everybody, and that gives me all the credibility to be honest. Wow. What an intro. <laughs> that's fantastic. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely awesome i mean your, your personality is way bigger than you know the, the person you are They're absolutely fantastic i have to do you know what if you walk into a room and you're taller than everybody else and you're twice the size of a normal human being <laughs> right people turn around and look and it was it was a bit rubbish really to be honest uh, it was all my own fault i wasn't a big drinker i just used to eat for i, I would eat until it stopped um and so yeah, I just, you've got to fill that suit. You've got to fill that suit. You can't fill that suit with a little you, personality. You, you're and, not hiding in the corners. No, you're not, you you're not hiding in the shadows. No, you can't. So what you've got to do, you've got to bring the fight to them. And so, and you've got to be self-deprecating in many ways. You make sure that you make the joke first before anybody else can. So you've stolen all their ammo. And also you've got to distract and you've got to make sure that what you're doing is so good that the other bits is background noise and so that's what i did and the the reason the reason i got smaller was i wasn't going to be sticking around you know it, 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 you know i was told that if you stay at this weight you're not here for long and so you know it was a bit of a horrible thing but there you go i'm alive to tell the tale and hopefully we'll stay alive for a lot longer and uh, i walk a lot and that makes all the difference i still eat badly i still eat badly right but i walk more and that works good for you what brought you from up north down to yorkshire into york you're york aren't you yeah living so, york. so what brought you to york um well i was, it was the time where you had to apply to go away to university somewhere okay and all of my friends had spent ages researching stuff and I realized it was the last day where you could put the forms in yeah. and I am so last minute. Yeah. And I just looked at a prospectus and I just went, uh, right. And this was at like 10 o'clock on the night where it had to be in for midnight. And I just went, right, I don't want to go too far. I go there. And I always thought I want to be far enough away so that my mum doesn't live in my house, right? But I want to be nearer, nearer, uh, near enough to make sure that if anything happens to my mum or my dad or my nana or whatever, I can be home in 
in no time. And so I wrote down three things. I wrote down York, Leeds and Sheffield. And I went for interviews. I, I wasn't mad keen on Leeds. Sorry, Leeds, but I wasn't. And uh, I went to Sheffield. I went, bah, that's a long way south. That's a long way south. Goodness me. Sheffield? How south is that? And then I went to York. And I got off the train. And I just thought, wow, this is like a school trip. <laughs> and 34 years down the line, yeah. with a beautiful wife and a wonderful life later, um, and two great kids, I still walk around the city of York and I just think, how do I live here? How do I live here? I used to tr have to travel eight miles to see traffic lights back up, right? <laughs> and I live in the centre of York and it is breathtaking. It's a place that looks beautiful on a rainy day, on a snowy day, on a sunny day. It can go toe to toe with any European city. It's just a beautiful place. And the people have taken me into their arts in York. I've, mm -hmm. I've done stuff in York that I could never, ever have dreamt. And we make stuff happen. It's beautiful. York's beautiful. Oh. It, it, it's like, it's quaint. It's got the cobbled streets. The history's still there. You know, everything's walking distance. Yes. It, it's, it's, it's a, it's it's a big, it's a big, it's a village with a big church. <laughs> like everywhere is walking distance. Yeah. And yeah. we, we are walking distance into town. Fantastic. We don't, it's the reason we don't have two cars. Yeah. Right. Because my wife says there's no way we have another car. We just walk into town and everything's there. We've got theatres, we've got cinemas, we've got everything. Restaurants, it's a beautiful place. I do love York. So you, you asked me about my story. How did I get into this? Mm. So he goes, we before me dad was born in Kenya in the 40s he grew up um, going to the drive-in cinemas watching the films at a distance but at the end of a film getting released they would give him the spools because he became friends with, with the cinema people and he would splice the eight mil spools and do some editing and, and fiddle about with with, with, the, with, the, with the tape absolutely oh what a nightmare and but <laughs> he loved it that he he loved it the whole motion picture thing the cinema the spools the splicing and uh, he, he just he was he was uh, mesmerized by motion picture not by photography he came across to england in the 60s um fast forward to the late 70s i was born early 80s um I fond memories of dad filming my uh sports days at primary school so that journey from him that's how i cottoned into it um dad used to film corporates and weddings i always used to help him on the weekends and and like on, on an evening i used to watch him splice film and then go into video editing and how he evolved yeah. his journey so how I, I grew up with all of this cameras lights don't know something go on i, I was brought up in a two up two down okay terraced house my dad outside of teaching yeah um, and he taught photography as one of the subjects at school oh, wow. that he brought in, but like as a completely different subject. And he was a sports and a wedding photographer. So I was surrounded by cameras. I actually had a dark room well, my in a tiny him. terraced house. Awesome. We had six foot by six foot stolen off my bedroom behind a false wood chip wall. And we had a dark room in my house and i thought everybody had one and they didn't so that <laughs> smell of fixer yeah, and developer yeah. and all that sort of thing so being surrounded by cameras and camera cases mm -hmm. and stuff like mm -hmm. that and Second my nature and my microphone case mm -hmm. now with my in-ear monitors and everything for my singing and my performing is my dad's first camera case no way from 1975 How and i take it to every job with me How and i don't have my dad anymore but i've got him with me in my corner on every gig so you've been surrounded by all that kit all that tech and it'll have changed shapes so nice. many times over the years won't yeah it? yeah well from here you can see that they're the old beat cam cameras I, I saw the yeah i saw the evolution there yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so um you know, back in the day, I don't know, twenty thousand pounds. Today, 
I don't know how much that would be worth. But yeah, so dad was in, in that. I was naturally immersed in it by default. I'm a creative by nature, not a businessman by nature. So as I went through school and university, I did a degree in design management. I studied in Leicester, then I went to Dublin. I worked there, then I moved to London. And, and anyway, cut a long story short, I got the bug and I came back to Leeds, back into our own business. I'm still in business with dad. And that's what's got me into, I suppose, where I am today. And, yeah. and what I do today, I use video to fix business problems. Simple as that. I think it's I think it's more relevant now than ever has. Because we need to see the people. Absolutely. We don't, I think, shiny websites have had their day. The number of people that look at a website and think that's shiny. Yeah. Well, what we've, I think what people have realized, people who are bright have realized that shiny doesn't necessarily have value. Yeah. Right. There's lots of things in this world that are shiny that are worthless. Yep. And it's all shop window and it's got no store cupboard. Whereas on a video, you capture somebody. You capture somebody's eyes. You capture someone's mannerisms. You capture the way they speak. You capture the gaps in how they speak. And you capture whether somebody can captivate you and whether, you know, whether they are a fit for you. Somebody rang me up yesterday and said, I'm wanting somebody to do this project, this dementia project. And I actually, after 10 minutes of talking to this lady on the phone, I talked her out of using anybody else. And I talked her out of using me. I said, you've got she told me about how she had staff who have not left in 12, 15 years, who had tremendous relationships with the people they care for. So I just said to her, I said, don't bring me in, get a topic. So getting it right, I said, I want you to go around every member of your staff, every member of your team, and I want you to get them to tell you a story of getting it right with somebody, and then making a mistake with somebody, and then about the impact of food, and the impact of, you know, music and all this sort of thing. Get it off them, I said. Then get in touch with me. Get me to sift through it all, filter it all, put it into a package, and then it's yours. Made by the people who are the experts. They are the people who deliver the care, who've not left you. And the fact that nobody's left you, the fact that you've got fantastic ratings from families, from the people who you care for, from CQC, speaks volumes. You don't need somebody with a shiny website and me charging you a bomb for that. No, we don't want that. Do us a favour, send us all your stuff and I'll just sift through it, filter it, make sure it's absolutely fantastic. And then your people will train your people the most organic, the most beautiful, and you know, you're backing everything up. Yeah. And that's that's one. So as you say, you're a creative, I'm a creative, but we're not necessarily good businessmen. I am shocking at business. But <laughs> I think the long term Yeah. I've seen a lot of people who are supposedly good good at business. <laughs> they were shocking people. Shocking. Right? And I don't care how much money they've got. I know billionaires, right, who they're so poor the only thing they've got is money. Um, and I know guys who haven't got the, the 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 life that I've got. And can I be right? I don't think some of the money has given them much because all they've got is stuff. Usually they're on their third wife, right? And rarely see their kids and this, that, and the other. And I'm very lucky. I'm, you know, I'm with the same, the same lass who foolishly, you know, <laughs> thought it was a good idea 25 <laughs> years ago and my kids still think I'm all right so I think that's where the real wealth is and when people go on about business I think they need to look at life more than business because can I be honest when you're in a box nobody cares how good a businessman you were it, it, it's funny you say that we I often talk about this concept of happiness mm. and and does money buy you happiness of course it doesn't there's yeah. things it can buy you. Of course it can. A nice holiday yeah. is nice yeah. and a lovely car is lovely. Of course it is. Of course it is. But, and, and people, I think, understand business from, in my opinion, in the wrong perspective as well. The business is supposed to serve your life, not be your life. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For some people, they're working eight days a week. They're working right around the clock. Yeah. And it's like, I need to make these, I need to hit these targets. Now, I understand everyone's under pressure. You know, the current climate is shocking. Yeah. <coughs> And you might feel under the pressure that you need to get that business in because you don't know what's around the corner. I get it. 
I'm, I, I'm the same. I, I work late nights sometimes when I have to. Don't we all? Yes. But, <coughs> but I can't stress the point that money doesn't buy you happiness. Yeah, I agree with you. A nice car, a nice holiday. Everyone needs that. But beyond that, I think I think happiness is a journey. I think it's not a destination. Yeah. I think you've got to take each day and each part of that journey as, you know, contribution and, and live in the moment. Otherwise, you can be too focused on either where you're going to get to or where you hope to get to. And you might even be dwelling on some of your past baggage as well. But I think the key thing is to live in the present. And I think a lot of people miss that as well. I have zero ambition. I really have no ambition. All I want from tomorrow is what I've had today. I'm really happy with me a lot. I've got some great paper around me. I do stuff that I enjoy, right? I I do stuff that I would do for now, and I do a load of stuff for now. I do a thing called Night to Remember that takes a month to organise, unpaid. I love it. It's great. I, I bring in the most amazing musicians and performers and everything. Put on an incredible night to bring a community get, together. We do a thing called Christmas Presents on Christmas Day, which I'm on with now. And it's a lot of work, but it doesn't matter. I just want, from tomorrow, another today. And enough is enough for me. I, I don't want anything more. I'm perfectly fine. I've got a lovely house in York. I live in York. I drive a car that I would drive if I won the lottery, right? I go on holidays. We love travel. We do that. Do you know what? I don't drink particularly. I'm, I maybe have a beer a week or something like that. I, I don't waste my money on stuff. I don't go for shiny stuff. It's a case of I do things that make make me happy make the kids happy like i spend stupid money on the kids right i do whatever they need fair enough but you're living the dream well put it this way if you saw my wife you'd think oh, he's a good talker is that lad and i am <laughs> i should but i should actually put a picture of my wife up on our on my website and say if you if you're wondering whether he's any good at talking <laughs> this is his wife who's been with him for 25 years even my son says, Dad, how on earth did you get with Mama? And I went, oh, thanks for that, Bill. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> but it's true. Nobody looks Nobody looks at Em and, went, and goes, Bah, isn't she lucky? <laughs> no, <laughs> to have him. Oh, the joy she must have. I'm sure so, that's not Yeah, so I've, I've, I'm do sure you know what? I am. I am. And my wife, you know, em, we were. I was working down in St. Ives. Yeah. And I was hosting a Care Awards down there. And we went out for a meal. It was a beautiful day. And she... She dropped a bombshell on me. It really shocked me. And she went, you semi-retired, Ian. I went, I'm not. She went, you are. You semi-retired. I went, ow. She went, right, you don't have to get up for work every day if you don't want to. You work with people only who you like and respect. And you do fun projects that you love. And you do voluntary stuff that you adore and you you know and you do things like you write and you write films and you do this that and the other and she went you love what you do and you do what you love she went that ain't work what you're doing and she went nobody's bossing you your hands are on your steering wheel and you only go where you like and she went and you've been doing that since you were 42 Ian. and I went I have <laughs> It suddenly dawned on me. And a bit of me thought, because semi-retired makes it just sound old, okay? <laughs> but then I just thought, semi-retired sounds like somebody who does what they want to do and has a freedom to choose. And I think that that's what wealth is, a freedom to choose. I think that if you're time rich and you choose what to do, to do with your time. So whenever I'm absolutely worn out and wrung out like a dishcloth, and I was the other day, you know, I bet I played at a festival at the weekend, I spoke at two conferences last weekend, I did all my other stuff, and I was like a wrung out dishcloth. My fault. I book it in, I know how much time's in a day, I know how much travel, I know how many people, I know there were 10,000 people, 14,000 people at that festival. I know what I'm letting myself in for. So when I look at the fuel gauge, right, when I take my eyes off the road and look down and go, oh, 
that <laughs> appears to be running on fumes. It's nobody else's fault. Mm. But after you recover from that for one day, you can then fill up the tank again and we're good go to again. go. And that's why, you know, I can get to come and talk to a nice guy like yourself <laughs> and, and reflect on things and think, do you know what? Life could be a hell of a lot worse. Ian, I love it. It's it's you're ambitious. You're doing what you enjoy, and when I say you're ambitious, you're helping people. You're out there doing things, making a difference, not only to yourself because of it. I can tell, I can tell the energy. I can feel the energy. I felt the energy the first time I met you, which was nearly vice versa. Same way, which was over nearly a year ago, first of December. It was, yeah, yeah, and and since then, every time we spoke as well. The work you do has such a strong impact on on the people around you. I've seen it. Yeah, and, and that's that's right, special. I think you give it right. Don't give us too much credit. No, no, no. I, I'm saying I'm, it how I'm, is. I'm going to do it another way, right? It's a very selfish thing. I discovered that doing really nice things feels amazing. When you're in love with somebody else, right? You're not with them for how you make them feel. You're with, with them, them for how, for how you... they make you feel. Yeah. I'm maybe a very selfish man, right? Who just happens to have a byproduct of the stuff I do that makes me feel incredible, helps other people. And I bring in amazing people. I surround myself with lovely people, kind people, good people, doers. I always, on any project, I have a handful of diamonds, not a barrel load of coal. You get a small number of people who are gonna make something happen, who believe in stuff, who are just incredible. You bounce an idea off them and then they bounce something off you. And if you surround yourself with really great, creative people, kind-hearted people, interest and exciting people, you never know. What the people are looking on might think you're one of them. And that would not be great. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great to think, oh, isn't he, isn't he a clever bloke? <laughs> yeah, no, not really. He's a clever bloke because he's surrounded by a load of clever men and women all around him. And so, uh, that's what it is. It's finding the right people. It's finding your tribe. It's finding the people that no matter you, what you've got to do, that make what you do, no matter how much hard work it is, that make it a joy and make it exciting. And whether that's with my band and I've got, I've got a nine piece band with three crew and people say, why have you got three crew that go out? Like there's pro bands don't have three crew. I went, because they're brilliant because they make sure we turn up at a gig and everything's set up immaculately. The sound's incredible. The lighting is all programmed, everything's. We put on big theater shows, sure. even when we play a smaller gig. And that's what it is. It's having the right people around you. And I'd rather make less money with having the right people, because that is where the true wealth is. You're too humble. And, no, I'm not. And, I'm a, I'm a no, great big head. I'm no, a no, big no, no, no. Le, le. <laughs> I, I think you're too humble, and I, I love it, and I love the concept of your tribe and your commu community, because I think there's an amount, an, an immense amount of wealth in that, because it's not about you journey. It's about taking everyone on the journey, and and that is something special. I just wish or I would I would like to think more and more people could latch onto that mindset. Because as we move forwards, the world is getting smaller, it's getting darker, and we need to help each uh, each other to make sure that they don't get in, fall into darkness and they can see the light and, and make the place a better place to, well, to live. Well, we can't change the world, but we can change our bit. Absolutely. And I, I, I love it. Yeah. I, I love community is our biggest untapped resource. The one, the one seam of our community that I think we really are missing out on, and they are the silver foxes, as I call them. People who've retired yeah. and then realize, what am I doing here? Yeah. What, loose women again? Goodness me, aren't there a lot of programs about antiques on telly? And they must just think, well, why have I, why have I ragged in work? And often people pack in work because it, it, it's a job that they don't necessarily enjoy, enjoy yeah. and so I've tried over the years to try and not grow up mm -hmm. to try and do the stuff that I, I still enjoyed as a kid Good. and if we use some of the all the people who've retired they've still got loads of skills right? they've got a lifetime of experience 
why are we not tapping into these people like my dad retired on friday okay on the friday he was 60 right he got out because one of his friends died and thought well he's loads fitter than me and if i don't get out of here now i'm gonna leave in a black car instead of a blue one and he retired on the friday and all of the northeast used him and his expertise every day for the next 20 years and he was organizing sports leagues and he was you know he was on committees and he was running this and he was running that and he was training up new teachers and he was doing stuff with kids creative writing and reading and stuff like that and he did that for 20 years until he had a stroke and there's people like my dad everywhere who are brilliant but if we don't use them they're going to become extinct they're going to die without us using that and they're just going to go around garden centers and play golf and that's not helping anybody whereas if we tap into that if we tap into that experience and the way they are with people my dad used to do school newspapers with junior school kids and he used to take them around to be journalists there was a new wind farm started awesome. in uh, Taolo, 36 windmills and when they were building them he took the kids up there and said right we're going to meet the people who are doing this and why they're doing this and one of the kids asked the question why does Taolo need a wind farm mister we've already got loads of it wow <laughs> little funny question. how funny is that Absolutely. and so we need to tap in to community to and we need to value people. The thing that gets me is, and this is why I work with all the people all the time, there's rhinoceroses out there and polar bears and pandas who are gonna be extinct. But what we don't realize is down our streets are people who've got stories that as soon as they go, those stories go too and they're not written down and we need to capture and we need to learn from people because I spent all 20 years of my career with young people and now I spend it all with people who are like 80 90 and 100 which basically might suggest that I don't play well with people my own age but what I find with those two generations when you remove our generation or whatever from in between you've got some great thinkers who aren't stale who don't think they're clever if you looked at the world's problems and got a room full of eight-year-olds none of them would say should we just book in 12 meetings <laughs> they wouldn't leave that room they wouldn't leave that room until it was sorted well for me you've got ambitious youngsters and you've got wisdom from the elders Correct. The, bit the, the problem is the people with the power are the people in the middle and they're the ones who think they're clever yeah. and many of them have been uh, promoted yeah. far too quickly and not based on anything they go to one interview they say I'm going to do A, B and C they start doing A and then they go to the next interview for the next job and they say I'm going to do D and F start doing D but haven't done the other bits then go for another interview I'm going to do G, H and I <laughs> and then what they do is before you know it they are the head of everything and if you ask them a question they can't answer because they've only got six letters in the alphabet because they've, non, they've not been near B or C or E and F or H and I and they've got to the top and they've been over promoted because they're good at interviews and it looks like they've done something but they've actually done out and that's the big worry so I think we, we need to listen more to young people and more to older people and I'll tell you what we'd be living in a much, much better, better world my daughter said this and this is quite shocking don't worry dad my generation will put this right and that's what she said when she was 17 doing her air levels all the stuff going on on the don't worry dad my little my little sort was out isn't that unbelievable unbelievable and i felt ashamed yeah when she said yeah. that yeah but i also believed in what she said yeah yeah i believed in what she said i've had a lovely time thank you very much for your time sir thank you thanks for coming mm -hmm.